Hello, welcome to PlayStation Access, my name's Nathan, and welcome back to our new regular feature, the Tuesday Checklist. Every Tuesday, the Access team takes inspiration from a recent or upcoming release to start a conversation about some of our favourite games. This week, having loved our time in Star Trek Bridge Crew, we've been talking about games that let us live out our geekiest fantasies. Star Trek VR lets you live out a few, well, lets me live out a few of my fantasies, uh, and maybe some of yours too. First of all, I'm in the Star Trek universe. Fantastic, because yes, I love Star Trek. Better than that, I can be on the bridge of a ship. My ship, our ship, the cruise ship. Better than that, I can be the captain of the ship, and I can be in charge of my actual friends. First of all, it's in VR. So, I mean, when I say you're on the bridge of the ship, you're literally there, you're looking around. It's really surreal because you're looking at your friends who are also in VR. They can wave at you, they can talk to you, and you, you know, they're there, they're on the bridge. It's so well recreated that that's where you are. You have to work together. It's really smart because like an actual Star Trek spaceship, which does exist, um, everybody has their job, you can't, as an individual control the ship, you have to work together. So as the captain, I can't actually move the ship. I have to talk to the guy at helm and then I have to talk to the guy at tactical to scan the enemy ships and fire the torpedoes. And he can't fire the torpedoes unless he gets power from the engineer. So he has to talk to the engineer. So it's like a proper uh, balancing act of everybody working together. It's like a real good example of teamwork. Be able to pass the Kobayashi Maru. Nobody can pass the Kobayashi Maru, Holly, unless I cheated, which is what I would do because I am Kirk. I wouldn't know. Which I just do it. I just actually there? do it. Which of the captains would you be? Which would I act? Which of the Star Trek captains is your favourite? Which captain? Who's my favourite captain? Captain Picard. Which captain would I be? Captain Picard. <laughs> 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 which one would I want to be? Maybe Captain Sisko with his amazing beard. The, from the beard era, not pre-beard. It's, it's got to be Mass Effect. The, in, the entire series basically allowed me to create the badass version of myself that like child me had always wanted to grow up to be. That also includes having awesome red hair and like cheekbones that I have to paint on, but like they're not painted in the game, they're real. And I get to have like super big guns and I have all these really cool friends but I get to have all these really cool friends who, as long as I do their loyalty missions, are like totally cool with anything I say to them at any time, which is the best feeling ever. It's about me being able to take that version of myself that you kind of picture yourself being, you know, where you are able to run for a bus without, you know, keeling over and you actually are super strong, but going on this kind of insane adventure in a place and in a time that I will never have access to. In my lifetime, we are not going to find a mass relay and uncover X number of new alien species and colonate new planets and live in the stars. But games like Mass Effect, they allow me to do that, to understand what it's like to meet a new alien species that has you know, a completely different way of living. You know, you've never really truly experienced Hamlet until you've seen it performed by an all Elcor cast. Do you play Paragon or Renegade or a bit of both? Okay, I always, I mean, I'll play, I've played Mass Effect, the, the first three anyway, probably seven or eight times start to finish. I can only play as Femme Shep. I can only play as Paragon with just a little bit of Renegade. Like there's just, you know, there's a couple of times you're like, okay, you, you need to shut up. Like, I'm, I'm gonna punch, I'm gonna punch you now. You're, you're going out this window. But if you don't go full Paragon anyway, you can't stop Miranda and Jack arguing, which means you can't actually save everybody anyway. So come on, I know what I'm doing. No way, because I say. Yeah, that's how you do it, that's how you do it. You have to be one or the other. Like, it has to be like full, but it's not just that there's like a special thing you need to like, you actually need to reprogram all your points. So then you can go like full Paragon, like full, full Paragon. And then you can save everybody. A game that let me live out my biggest geek fantasy at the time was Red Dead Redemption. When Red Dead Redemption came out, for some reason I decided to choose then to watch just all the westerns in the world ever, having never been interested in westerns really. Like I was looking on IMDb and saw that The Good, The Bad and The Ugly was like number three of all times. So I should probably watch that. And it was amazing. And so then I watched the entire Dollars trilogy and I watched High Noon and watched 
Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and Once Upon a Time in America and fell in love with the Western genre. And then Red Dead Redemption came out and it was like GTA, but in the Wild West. And it absolutely was that. It was like the greatest cowboy fantasy ever and you got to live it. And it wasn't just, you know, being on the horse and riding around and doing all the shootouts and doing the duels. There was something about existing in that world that really captured the cinematic essence of all of those amazing Western films. Like particularly, I love the, the spaghetti Westerns, Sergio Leone spaghetti Westerns. And the kind of contrast, you get a lot of contrast between close-ups of people's faces and they'd be all weather-beaten and wrinkly and full of sand. And then you get massive expansive shots of these enormous deserts filled with like monolithic mountains and tiny little figures riding across them on horseback and Red Dead Redemption allowed you to feel that. It was so open and empty and sometimes open world games can feel really open and empty and it's a bad thing but in Red Dead Redemption it was an amazing thing like I wanted that to happen and then obviously you'd have the jewels as well and playing poker and just going into a bar just ordering a drink in a bar as John Marston like all the other stuff was great, like all the missions and the story, and, but just being a cowboy, just existing as a cowboy, and Red Dead Redemption did it so perfectly. Like, I'm, not, I'm sure it wasn't a realistic representation of what the Wild West was actually like in real life, but I didn't want that. I wanted the cinematic version of it, and Red Dead Redemption gave it to me. Have you ever owned a cowboy hat, legitimately? No, I have owned numerous pairs of cowboy boots, however, that's and went, amazing. Like, <laughs> I still have. <laughs> no, not Spurs. Oh. <laughs> they were quite like knee-length cowboy boots. Knee-length. Yeah, I thought I thought they were really my cool. Cowboy boots were wrong. What did you do in the boots? Just walked around. <laughs> <laughs> like underneath my jeans, but I really liked the kind of. I liked the heel they had on them. They had a really, and they had like shorter ones, like actual you know boot boots. But they were they were that cowboy style, like the curved back raised heel with the little buckle on them and they made the little clinky sound when you walked. Have you still got them? In my attic somewhere probably yeah. I mean they were really expensive. I remember buying them and like oh those will last you a long time. But did you wear them out? Like were, you know were you thinking I'm gonna wear, did you get them and bottle it or did you used to wear them around? I wore them to work Dave. <gasps> my first job oh, I wore them. Not when you've worked with me then? No. I've never seen them. No no no. I was very young. <laughs> Yeah, I, I could get away with it then, that, Dave. The clip clock. I hear the telltale tip clock. I'm like, Rob's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. could get away with it like then, Rob though, Dave, because I had like I had long, luscious locks of brown hair. <laughs> Just you know, I can't wear them now, obviously, because I'm a slightly overweight, bald man in his thirties. I'd love to see it. If it can't be Star Trek, it's going to be Star Wars. Other, I mean, to be honest, star thing. to be honest, even if it can be Star Trek, it might still be Star Wars for me. There's no doubt, I've done a lot of cool things in games, but the coolest thing, like, fulfilling my fantasy the most is Star Wars Battlefront, but more than that, Star Wars Battlefront VR. The VR mission is unbelievable. If you haven't played it, even if you have a passing interest in Star Wars, you need to play it. The interior of the X-Wing is completely modelled, complete with buttons that you can press. I mean, there must be like 30 buttons that you can actually press and things happen. You can press the button to bring up the targeting scope. You know from, from A New Hope, when Luke destroys the Death Star, uh, he turns on, brings up his targeting computer, then he turns it off, Obi-Wan's like, Luke, use the force, Luke. And he's like, hmm. And he turns it off and then like, he's turned off his targeting computer. Luke, are you okay? And he's like, I'm all right. I never understood why they're all right with that. I'd be like, could you turn on your scope again? We've got a job to do. Wait, no, I'm okay. I'm gonna use, what? I'm gonna use the force. Don't use the force, use the targeting computer. What are you doing, you idiot? Anyway, it's got a targeting computer. You even have a little R2 unit who you can turn around and look at. And if you look at him, he sort of beep, he's like bloop, bloop, bloop. I don't know what he's saying, but I like to think that it's nice. More than anything, I think in Star Wars, the thing that I love the most is, is being in space. It's the space battles, the space combat, and X-Wings are the coolest ships. Like, if I can't be in the Millennium Falcon, 
you know, that would be, that's the ultimate dream. That would be, we'd just do this video, would just be on the Millennium Falcon, but then an X-Wing. I'd quite happily just sit in the cockpit and press all the buttons, and I have done that because you can do that before you start the game if you want. You can spend just as long as you want looking at the buttons. You can lock S-foils into attack position. I mean, I have wanted to do that since I was like eight, definitely, and now I've done it, and it felt as good as I thought it would. Yeah, I know. I didn't have a lot of friends. I grew up playing Final Fantasy. It is by far the gaming series that turned me from a kid who was like lucky enough to own games consoles to actually a kid who was obsessed with video games. Like it, it, that was the transformation game, specifically Final Fantasy VIII. But I was still like a young girl growing up, and like you got to play as Cloud, who was just a moody bloke, and you got to play as Squall, who was just a moody bloke, and then you got to play as a Dane, who was a monkey, and then you got to play as Titus or Titus, or whichever way you want to call it, who just shouted a lot and laughed a lot. And Final Fantasy XIV was the first time I was ever allowed to really take character customization and put myself into the world of Final Fantasy and to look the way I wanted a main character to look and to like act and interact with the way I would want the main character to look and to fight the way I wanted a main character to look. I have the red hair, I play Dark Knight because I believe the only sword that should ever be in my hands needs two hands to hold it. I, or an axe, I also play, I also play Warrior. But I'm tanks, so it's like my job, I run in first. Like I'm always first into the battle, I take the boss, I take all the damage, I hold it while the rest of the team is healing me, buffing me, and you know, they're the ones that are actually killing the boss, but I'm the one, it's like, if I go down, you're all in so much trouble. It allows me to be in a space that I've always wanted to be in, that I've always, I've always, I was a daydreamer as a kid. Still I'm a daydreamer as an adult. And, but it's like me, it's my character doing it, and I'm in full control, and, as a team of people as well who are in the same experience like we have to all work together to be the heroes as well there's no like crazy tale where somehow i'll make it through on my own it's like no no it's so real that if one of us goes down this whole thing will fall apart my other favorite fantasy that a game has allowed me to live out would be in assassin's creed 4 black flag not anything to do with being an assassin because all the assassin's creed games let you do that but specifically being a pirate in the Caribbean Sea was amazing. Like it came out of the blue that, and remember Assassin's Creed 3 when it was like, oh, by the way, here's some boat bits with an amazing ocean tech engine that we've built. And anyone who's a regular viewer of the channel will know I have a weird infatuation with water physics in games. I just love how it's all beautiful and wavy. And Assassin's Creed 4 has the best water still, I think, ever. That's a big rolling ocean, open world, full of it. And I love just being in command of a ship with my crew that I had assembled myself. Like, you free them early on in the game, they're all captive. And you free them and you escape on this ship that you commandeer. And you have to escape through this storm and rogue waves are coming at you and massive water spouts. And then you get away and you find shanties and you can order your crew to sing the songs and you pull up at the the little shanty towns, whatever they're called, I don't know, the pirate places. And it's all tropical and lovely and you get off your ship and you go to the bar and you have some rum, you get into some fights. Then you get back on your ship and you just go out wherever you like and you find some treasure on an island. It was so liberating. It was such a, a feeling of freedom. And it was so different to any Assassin's Creed game before that and since. And are you a, what kind of captain are you? Are you one of the lads? Come on lads. Or are you, <laughs> <"F> off lads. <laughs> <laughs> was that your idea of good pirate, bad pirate? Yeah, that was it. Am I a good pirate or a bad pirate? Is that what you're but, saying? But good pirate captain or a bad pirate captain? I'd say I'm a good pirate captain. I mean, I never lead my boys astray. We always win the fights. <laughs> or you reload. Or I reload <laughs> my <laughs> save, yeah. No, good captain. Is he one of the lads? Would, would they do anything for Captain Yeah, they would. Rob Sparrow. Rob Sparrow. <laughs> because I saved them all in the first place. My first mate, he loves me. All my <laughs> lads, they all love me. Oh, it's just, it was an amazing feeling of freedom, just being at the helm of that ship. The way he turns the helm as well, like, really kind of uh, rolls it and then it rolls back the other way. It's just like it is in the movies. Brilliant. 
Yeah, the Jackdaw. What a great name for a pirate ship as well. Let me play more pirate games. I would love to play more pirate games like that. Isn't it weird that your two geek fantasies are basically the same, just on different terrain? Yes. I mean, a pirate of the sand <laughs> and a pirate of the sea. Yeah. A cowboy of the sea. A pirate is basically a cowboy, but in the sea. Yeah. Yeah. A water cowboy. Yeah. A, a water, water cowboy. cowboy and a sand pirate. <laughs> Those are my two fantasies. Thanks, Rob, and thank you for watching. Let us know what you think we should cover next week in the comments. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to Access for much more like this.